Hi, I'm Julie and I live with my husband, James. And we have a son, Joshua, who has just turned three. Um, we actually also have another baby brother for Joshua on his way in March. So Joshua's got a moderate to severe hearing loss, but this diagnosis has actually changed as he's grown. So it started off as mild to moderate, but then it seemed to be a progressive hearing loss to the point where three hearing tests actually suggested it was profound. So we were referred to a cochlear implant centre. But then the latest diagnosis is back to moderate. So unless anything changes again, um, we don't actually meet the eligibility criteria for a cochlear implant at the moment. So we're sticking to two hearing aids as the technology we're using with Joshua for the foreseeable future. Um, it was actually very early on as his newborn screening test came back with an inconclusive hearing test result. So we were asked to take him back to the hospital audiology department for a fuller test a couple of weeks later and didn't really think too much more about it at that point of time because we were told that nine in ten babies were taken back are actually fine. But after a long afternoon of about three hours of waiting for Joshua to fall asleep, which he had to for these tests, we were finally able to start the test with the audiologist who cancelled her yoga session as well bless her, for the evening just to be able to give us um, some of her time for some of the tests and as she was performing the tests I could see the tone of voice change and sort of knew something was wrong then we couldn't complete the tests that night so we needed to go back to the hospital about a week later and then we went a bit more prepared for the bad news that time and that was when it was confirmed that um, he had what was a mild at that time hearing loss. No we weren't actually aware that the genetic counselling process existed until we were suggested it by um, Joshua's specialist community paediatrician. So we also spoke to his audiologist about it and other healthcare professionals that were involved in his care at a multi-agency meeting. So it was a community paediatrician who made the actual referral for Joshua to the clinical genetic service and that was when he was around four months old. So after we were referred actually nothing happened for about a year because there's such a long waiting list um, for the service but then around one year later the ball started to roll and the first stage of the assessment involved a series of phone calls um, with a geneticist. So she took a comprehensive medical history of Joshua, mine and James's family over the phone and discussed um, the results of numerous tests Joshua had already had. So these were tests such as vision tests, blood tests, his audiology tests, a kidney scan and an MRI, just to name a few, but that didn't add to the test he had. It was just a case of talking through all the results with the geneticist to make sure all the information that she had in front of her was correct. And then a couple of months later, we took Joshua for a physical examination with the geneticist. And I was really surprised about all the detailed photographs that she needed to take of all different parts of his body and his hands and his face and looking into the ear, his feet. Um, but it's amazing how much they can pick up from some of those photographs. And so it wasn't an invasive process at all, just a detailed examination really of different parts of his body. And that um, physical appointment with the geneticist was probably about six months after the initial telephone consultation. The results came back around 11 months after we'd had that face to face appointment. So by that time, me and my husband had almost put the, the test into the back of our minds and forgot about it. Well, knowing that it was still there in the background, but not thinking about it daily as we had to start with. And the results were probably about two years later than the initial referral was made. So it was quite a long process, but definitely worth it as it did find a cause for Joshua's deafness. And I know in a lot of cases it doesn't. So that was maybe more unique for us, but um, we're really glad we did it to find out that result. And the cause for Joshua's 
um, hearing loss is an underlying condition called CHARD syndrome. And that only affects around one in say about 10,000 babies. So it's quite a rare condition. So first of all, we had a telephone conversation with the clinical geneticist. And I think that's quite unusual just to be told over the phone so quickly, but it was in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. So there were no face-to-face -face appointments, um, but she still just gave us a really brief indication of what this meant over the phone and gave us the offer to phone her back um, anytime we wanted or when we were ready for more information which we did so a couple of days later after having the chance to go away and research the condition and talk to some other parents that we were put in touch with ourselves. And then this was followed up by a typed letter then a couple of weeks later, which went into more detail. So basically we were told sort of four main things in that letter. So firstly, how charge causes deafness, how it's inherited, um, future implications of what that would mean for Joshua himself, and implications for us then as um, having any further children so forth. So in terms of um, how it causes deafness, we didn't receive detailed information on this to start with, as I think it's quite, well, a very complicated um, genetics issue to understand. But basically we were explained that charge involves a change in a gene called CHD7, which in turn causes the hearing loss. Um, it's usually due to abnormalities in a cranial nerve, but this wasn't actually picked up in Joshua's scan himself. So it was only through the genetic testing that we found out about that. Um, secondly, how it's inherited. We were told that unless the parents have charge, in which case their future children actually have 50% chance of inheriting the mutation as it's a dominant um, gene, the mutation to the CHD7 gene normally occurs randomly. So me and my husband have actually had parental testing following this and fortunately found that we're not carriers of charge. So in terms of implications of any future children for us, um, it's very low. So there's only around 1% risk that our next child, which is due in March, will also have the syndrome. Um, so it's a very low risk, but still quite significant when you know that affects a baby's life inside of you. But however, for Joshua, the risk of his child having charge syndrome himself is actually 50%. So that's far more significant than a different game altogether. Um, in terms of how it might affect Joshua in future, we understand that the signs and symptoms of charge can vary a lot from child to child. So Joshua's only three, so it's very early days so far. But the only um, symptom he's noticeably exhibiting is really a hearing loss and delayed development. Um, so we're going to continue monitoring this as he grows and the paediatric team have agreed to arrange appropriate assessments of him. And we can ensure then he has all the support he needs to provide his full, um, to reach his full potential. We're also sending him to a specialist unit within a mainstream school but knowing all about charge and what we can expect really is just helping us to make sure that we give him the best chance of thriving in life by having all the right support provided for him. I think it's fair to say we found the whole process very long from start to finish. That's obviously understandable why there's a long waiting list and some of the tests and examinations that have to be carried out involve really extensive testing. But as it was around two years from when that initial referral was made to when we found out the results, um, we did have to sort of prepare ourselves to wait a lot and not expect results the next day as you do with some tests. And when I was given the initial results, it was just over the phone in quite a quick conversation. But that again was, a special circumstance due to um, COVID and restrictions due to face-to-face -face, um, appointments. So I think under normal circumstances, that would have been quite different. 
but in hindsight looking back it did actually work quite well although the initial conversation I had over the phone with the geneticist was quite quick and only lasted about 10 minutes and came as a bit of a shock she left me with the option to phone back at any time or email with any further questions so it gave myself and my husband some time to go away and research the condition ourselves and actually our audiologist put us in touch with one other family who had a child with child syndrome and that was really helpful to talk with them and they have just yeah been really supportive and given us a lot more information so when I was able to go back to the geneticist then a couple of weeks later I had a list of questions already prepared and she answered everyone in so much detail and really filled us with confidence that actually there was a plan to go forward. We felt confident that we then knew what this could mean for Joshua, even though we understood that it can be very varied from child to child and a lot of how it would affect Joshua might be unknown for quite some time. We'll just have to monitor it. And also I think it's worthwhile saying that when I fell pregnant again, then I emailed back for some further advice. And within hours, actually, I was responded to and given a call with the, another geneticist um, the following day who talked through a range of options that were available to me to do in pregnancy. So the team have just been incredibly supportive and given um, answers to any question I've asked since. Nothing outstanding actually. I think we were really well informed um, of what we had to expect. Although it was a lengthy process, we were advised that it would be in advance, so it didn't come as a shock to us. So actually, yeah, I can't think of anything else really that the medical professionals could have done other than maybe just to have had an opportunity to talk with another parent who had already been through that experience um, could have been useful because I think hearing from another parent and that human touch about what how it actually affects your life um, could be useful but most things were very clearly explained to us before the process even began and transpired as we were expecting. <laughs> Um, so I think everyone might have different circumstances, but to me, knowledge is power and you've really got nothing to lose by going through the procedure, other than possibly a couple of sleepless nights. Um, but it's not invasive in any way, so I really don't think there's anything to lose by um, trying the process and just seeing if a uh, reason for the hearing loss can be found. Um, for us, we're extremely glad that we opted to go ahead with it as it uncovered the cause of Joshua's hearing loss. So that in turn helped us to develop a more appropriate support package for him. It's helped us to explain some of Joshua's other behavioural features that we might not have otherwise been able to explain. And really importantly, be aware of risks for our future children and grandchildren also of inheriting that condi condition. Firstly, I think I've got to um, say at the start of this question that I'm still learning myself. Um, Joshua's only just turned three and every month seems to bring a new challenge that we just about managed to overcome before the next one surfaces. Um, but one of the most valuable things I found is actually just talking to other parents and finding out your child is deaf can be life changing. And there's so many decisions you're faced with, um, hearing aids or cochlear implants deaf schools or mainstream schools do we support speech or do we use sign language and other parents and um, talking about them with their experience can help with these really big questions as well as just through sharing little tips like how do you keep babies hearing aids in and I found that to be um, really helpful with overcoming a lot of the challenges we face so far I'd also say take all the help you've, you're offered. There's so much out there. So we joined the National Deaf Children Society. We um, went to a regular um, sensory play group every Friday and I started learning sign language as well. And I found that's actually enriched my life in some ways, just linking with the deaf community and finding out um, all the opportunities out there for 
children and adults to really engage in new ways and using signs can help your little one's development um, if they're hearing or not hearing and I've just really enjoyed becoming more immersed in the deaf community and some of the new friendships I've made through that.